know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here is your host, Reverend Jeff Peterson. Well, today we, we continue our study on 1 Peter, and we'll be into 1 Peter chapter 5. And so here again, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. He was a person who, who actually denied Jesus. He denied Jesus three times that he, that, he even, uh, that he had even known Jesus. But then when it came right down to it, after the resurrection, and here again, uh, Jesus was a follower and a, a disciple Peter was a disciple of Jesus and that he learned from Jesus and he witnessed so many things. And he revealed, Jesus revealed his glory to Peter. Some examples of this was when Jesus was transfigured up on a mountain where he showed his heavenly, his divine glory. Another time was when Jesus was out on a sea with the disciples, or the disciples were out at the sea, it was stormy, they thought that their lives were going to perish, and then Jesus appears to them walking on the water, but here again in the glory of being the divine Son of God. Jesus witnessed the risen, or excuse me, Peter witnessed the risen Jesus, and, he, and it was after that that he became such a strong believer that the Holy Spirit was so powerful within him that once he preached a sermon where there were over 3,000 people that came to, to faith. And so what I'm getting at here is that, well, Peter is addressing the Christian people. And he is talking about the persecution that, well, has already started to happen, but will really be coming in a big wave, and that will be the persecution that Nero will show or do. And that is the Emperor Nero. But Peter ends up losing his life. And so it shows the power of the Holy Spirit, of his strong faith working within him, that as he talks about what it means to be a suffering servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he actually lives these words. When he talks about the blessedness of being a Christian, of being a follower of the Lord, but he know, knows that his life is not in this world, but rather it is in the world to come. I mean, he is so firm in his faith and in his convictions of knowing that, that there is a heaven, that there's a heavenly Father, and that Jesus, like the heavenly Father has revealed himself to us in Jesus, and that Jesus is arisen. And he says how difficult it will be for the believers to come and to be saved. But how about for those who do not believe? Saying, well, there's no way that they can come to salvation. They're so lost in the dark woods that they would not even know how to take the first step. And so I read from 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning with the first, actually verses 1 through 4. To the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's suffering, and one who also will share in the glory of the revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock, that is, under your care, serving as overseers, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not greedy for money, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. And so here again, this has to do with what is the meaning of life. I know living in, in the United States culture, the meaning of life is maybe living the American dream. And that American dream changes all the time. The you know, American dream used to always be that you could you know, have a job and have enough income to support your family and to 
They have a nice little house with a garage with a car in it. They have a few kids and maybe a dog that's running around in the backyard. And now the American dream seems like it's taking a whole new level. Now it's having a big yacht to be able to cruise around in on a river or on, out on the sea. It's to have you know, multiple mansions around the country where you can go and visit all these you know, very special paradise places. It's to have so many automobiles that you can't count them anymore. You know, and swimming pools in the backyard and on and on and on. But that's the whole thing about being a Christian is that a lot of times people think, well, what's, what's appealing about the Christian life? What does that have to do with this American dream that I'm after? Well, it has to do with your soul. What's going to bring contentment? You have to first of all understand that you are a mortal being. And I think that's a lot a lot of people just have come to deny. They don't they, they deny death. But we all come to that time in that place where we where we will where we will die. And we've got to find our peace in this life. And that's the whole thing is that you know, we can fill our lives with so many things, but but yet be so empty. But it's when we come to know Jesus that we are that we are so satisfied. It's like I don't need this. The old American dream is just fine. I'm, I'm happy. I, you know, having, having the Lord, having the joy of the Lord in my life and, and to know that, that I don't live for this world as I live for the next world and as I live for the next world or the salvation that has come to me in Jesus Christ, that all of a sudden now I find that living in this life now takes on meaning and purpose that I didn't otherwise have. And so that's what Peter came to recognize, as well as so many of the other followers, is that they came to recognize that there's the life that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, that that is the abundant life. It's the fulfillment of life. And it is worth dying for. Because after all, we're all going to die anyway. It doesn't matter you know, if we die at age 4 or if we die at age 104. I mean, death comes to us all. But the whole question is, is do we know Christ? To know Christ and to make Christ known in our lives. To notice that we are completely satisfied in that heaven has come down to us in Jesus and so that we are we're living as the, the children of the Heavenly Father. That we're members of the church. That we have the assurance of salvation. And all of a sudden our lives take on a whole new meaning, a whole new level of meaning. They say that I'm not about trying to take advantage of my neighbor, but to love my neighbor, to be in relationship with my neighbor. To heal wounds. To not be about war, but rather striving for peace. Not trying to conquer another nation or take over somebody else's property, but... How do we work together so that everybody in this world can prosper? That everybody has a place in this world. You know, that we are not greedy, but rather that we are generous in life and finding that, wow, it's a lot more fun to be generous in life than it is to be greedy in life. You know, instead of spending you know, a whole vacation on, on just being a glutton, Going out and serving, serving those who are in need, those who are poor, going on a mission trip. Saying, so, you know, oh, that was a far more meaningful, far better vacation than, you know, just simply feeding my own big belly. And so our values change. It's just like, I don't want all this stuff anymore. You know, it's interesting because as I live my life, you know, I have my mother, because my father died, and I have that generation, and then my generation, and my children's generation. And so I was trying to think of what's going to be handed down from generation to generation, and, and what I'm finding now that is interesting is that, well, I've got so much stuff, it's like, oh, you know, if my mother wants to get rid of stuff, what am I going to do with it? Because right now I'm at that point in my life where I'm trying to get rid of some stuff. But then as I look at my kids, they're what you call minimalists. They don't want anything. You know, even heirlooms, it's like, I don't want them. 
I want the simple life. I want to be free from all of this stuff. And it's true, you're healthier if you don't have to be worrying about a lot of stuff. You know, I don't know about your community, but my community, I see more and more of these storage sheds going up all over the place. It's like, what are we going to do with all this? Just put it in more and more storage sheds? You know, we can keep building more and more barns, but what does Jesus say? Is that, well, your life is going to be taken tonight. What good is all? You can continue to put more, just have more and more barns of money all the time. But what good is it if you're going to be dying tonight? You know, I have the true wealth from heaven. You know, the gift of salvation, the priceless treasure being Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to find in our lives, is Jesus. Because as I read First Peter, you know, Peter is just talking about suffering. Yeah, yeah, you're living the blessed life. You know, you will experience the glory of the Lord and you will draw, as, as you seek the Lord, he will draw very close to you, that you will know the Lord and in your life, you're just going to continue to grow and build and in your faith and in your life in him. But, and to know that, hey, you know, I'm willing to give my life and to serve the Lord and, and to be humble in my life. Because, that's what's, because that is what matters. And so that's what Peter is talking about here when he's talking about the leadership of the Christian church. That they need to be humble. They need to be the shepherds. They need to be the elders. They're the elders of the church. So in other words, if you are wanting to be a leader in the church, you have to understand that you are being the example. That you are here to serve. That you're not leading in a dominant, controlling way, but rather in your love. How are you leading people? How are you building them up? And that's always the thing that in the church is that we all come there because we need to be strengthened in our faith. And we are looking to others as the example because a lot of people say, okay, Pastor Jeff, I was listening to you in your television talk, and I agree, and so now I'm kind of walking into this church and I'm looking for all these people who are going to come and love me and surround me and who are going to help me to grow in my faith. But if all they're experiencing are just a bunch of people who are criticizing and backbiting and, and just you know, being arrogant and controlling, manipulating, it's like, <laughs> I don't think so. This is not the place for me. And so I always think, you know, I think about Kids, youth. You know, youth, they've got their detectors that are 10 feet long, and they're always asking, is there anything about this? And they're going to sniff it out. They're going to know if this is a genuine. Is this something that's genuine, or is this just some kind of a hypocritical piece of pie here? They're going to know. And so they're watching the believers. And they're going to be watching their attitudes. They're going to be watching their their conduct. And so they're here because they're supposedly Christians. Okay, so as they are here, they're going to be watching. Is there anything to this at all? And it's amazing because some of these young people will look and say, wow, boy, in the church I've met some of the, most, the finest people and they're actually living what they believe. <laughs> They're walking what they talk, and they talk what they walk, and, and I'll tell you what, there's something very attractive to that, and that's how I want to be. But it's not just the youth, but it's also the adults. Adults are just as much into doubting and questioning and wondering as youth are. And so as a person who's kind of a little bit on the tired side, oh yeah, I've, been, <laughs> I've kind of mopped up the bar I don't know how many times in my life. I've cheated my neighbors. I've cheated my family. I'm kind of sick of this life, and so now I'm going to kind of head into the church, and I'm going to be looking at all these fine people and to see, is there anything to this? And if the person is surrounded by genuine Christians who care, well, I'll tell you what, this person is going to take a new direction in their life. But if the people that they're surrounding themselves with don't really, they're not living what they believe, 
And all they hear is just a bunch of down in the mouth people. They're going to say, <laughs> I think I'll just head back to the bar. I, I think I found a lot more <laughs> substance to what these people are about. You don't need to go to the church to have people backbiting and criticizing and controlling. No, you need people who will love you, people who are going to encourage you, people who are going to build you up, people who are going to be that example for you. And that's what he is saying here. You know, we have enough people who are chipping away at us. There's enough greedy people in this world. There's enough people who are trying to lord it over us. There's enough people who are trying to cheat us. There's enough people who are wanting to harm us and do us wrong that we don't need to go to the church to find more. The church has to be a different place. It has to have a standard. And I'm not trying to say that church people are better than everybody else. I'm just saying that church people need to represent Jesus. That we need to be Jesus for the world. And so that's what people, as we seek Jesus, we seek his church, we seek his people, and his people better be just that. Because God does not take kindly to those who are not following in his ways. And so I read in verse 5 then, Young men, in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. So verse 5, a lot to be said there. You know, that the young are to honor the elders. To say that these are people who have, who are, who have, been, in the, who have been living their faith for some time. They're mature. They're well-seasoned Christians. There's a lot for me to learn from them. Their faith has been tested many times. And so you look up to them. And you seek their guidance. But then the elders, the older generation, we also then try to do what we can to serve the younger generation, understanding that every generation is special. That the young people today are special. And it's kind of fun to be able to visit with them. And I can learn a lot from them now, too, because they always seem to be very uh, techno-handy. If I'm having a little bit of problems with my cell phone or my computer or something, I'll talk to one of them and and just like that, they can show me how it works. And so it's kind of a give and take to say that, that it's not just about my generation, but we need to be intergenerational. When we look at the church, that's one of those special places where we can be that. It's where all the generations come together. And then we can share in God's love and, and to share the specialness of each generation. And so there are things, you know, we always think about the generation gap. There's things that maybe, you know, I remember my parents' generation, there's things that they didn't like about my generation, and now my generation, as we look at the next generation, we kind of go, oh. Well, we just have to get over it, understand that this is how this generation expresses themselves. As a matter of fact, there's no harm in what they are doing in so many ways that they express themselves, but that we can come to enjoy each other and to say, well, we have one thing in common here, and that we have the love of Jesus, that we're united in our Lord Jesus Christ. In verse, uh, ch uh, chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. you know, humble ourselves, that's kind of stripping ourselves of all of our arrogance, our self-conceit, all that human pride, or somehow, you know, we want, you know, and, and how far do we go with that? Well, our human nature is that we want to be God. We want to sit on the throne. But to humble ourselves before the Lord. That is to say, God, you are my God. Uh, you, I, you are the creator. I'm the created. I'm the beggar here. I'm in need of you. And so we cast all of our anxiety. Now, anxiety, it seems like 
anxiety. There's all this anxiety, all this stress, all this tension. There's lots of things that can bring that on. Generally, it's compounded. There's a combination of things. And I've studied psychology, so I could actually teach you all these techniques as far as how to get rid of a lot of your anxiety. But here, Peter, who never studied psychology, just says, you know, that we should cast, you know, that we cast all of our anxiety on him. In other words, Take all of what's troubling you and, and pray about it. Just lay it before the Lord's feet. God, this is what stresses me out today. This is all the anxiety, all the worry that I have. Well, we got you know, sets of it. When we think about our kids, these, this is my set of anxiety. When we think about our work, this is my set of anxiety. As I try to keep my house going, this is my set of anxiety. As I try to get things done at the church, this is my whole set of anxiety. And so we have all of our sets of anxiety, and then we can even have the cross sections of it. Jesus is saying, just, just hand it to me. Just, just let me deflate you. Because I care about you. And I'll give you my peace. You know, one of those psychology techniques is just to write out everything. You know, just, just, just take a pen and a piece of paper and just write everything out that, that you're stressed out about, what your anxiety is, because you're taking it from within and you're getting it out. And then when you get it done, you just say, God, here it is. I'm, and it does work. You are getting it out and you're praying about it, saying, God, I've just named all of my anxiety before you. And... You can do different things with it. You can, you can burn that piece of paper, or, or what I like to do is take a shredder, you know, like a paper shredder, and just pray over it and saying, God, this is my anxiety, and I'm giving it to you, and here I'm putting it into the shredder, and, and it's being all chewed and eaten up, and, and God gives us his peace. His peace that surpasses all human understanding. And so that's the power of God working in our lives through prayers that we can, you know, hand it all over to him. And then verses, uh, chapter 5, verses 8 through 11, be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion, a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brother throughout the world, are undergoing the same kind of suffering. And the God of all grace, who called you in his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, uh, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To, you, to him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Well, here again, we're talking about all this persecution. If God's in the world, everything should be just fine, right? Well, you have to remember is that we also have the devil in the world. Now, he, God and the devil are not equal. The devil is actually created by God. He's a fallen angel. And the day will come when he will be put into the lake of fire. But yet he wreaks a lot of havoc in this world, but he doesn't have to. And so here again, these are the tips that Peter gives us. You know, if we read in Ephesians chapter 6, you know, the Apostle Paul addresses the same thing. He talks about it as being the armor of God to be strong against the wiles of the devil. And so that's the thing about the writers of the Bible is that they all knew the devil. They know the devil's power. And they know that we all need to be doing something to be strong against the devil. And they give us very good words of advice. And so this is Peter now giving advice, saying, understand that you're going to be in spiritual warfare. You know, it's kind of like playing basketball. Oh, I go into the basketball gym, and, and here's our team, and we're having such a good time, and, and we're just shooting layups and free throws and three-point shots. And all of a sudden we look at, well, who are these other people over there? Oh, the other team. We didn't know that there's going to be an opposition that's going to be preventing us from making baskets. 
and we got to try to do what we can to make sure that they don't make baskets. And we have to figure out ways to make baskets as they try to prevent us from doing that. And so that's what we're getting at here is that, that as you live the Christian life, that is when you follow and pick up your cross and follow Jesus, that all of a sudden, oh, I didn't realize, what's this all about? You're going to come to know the devil. I know there's all this debate, is there a devil, is there not a devil? Well, start living the Christian life. Start following Jesus, carry the cross, and I'll tell you what, you're going to know, uh, you're going to come to know the devil really well. And so you can have theologians that sit in their big fancy offices and their classrooms and they can talk about, you know, start living the Christian life and, and you will come to know the devil really well. Trust me on this one. And so this is what Peter has to say, is that he's roaring around like a lion looking for somebody to devour. So he says, resist him. And so how do we resist him? We we'll just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, you flee. You remember that you are a child of God, and don't forget that, because the devil's going to always try to get you to compromise that, or to think, well, I'm not a child of God. No, you are. As long as you know who you are and what you are about, then, then the devil's not going to be able to trip you up and sidetrack you. And so you always keep firm in the Lord, always keeping your focus on Jesus, always keeping your focus on the cross, and that will give you... Uh, so much so much strength in that as you grow in your faith, you will become wiser and stronger, saying, oh yeah, I know, this is the devil's tricks, this is the devil's pattern. I recognize this. This is a well-worn path. Why am I going to go down it again? I know where this leads. You know, just like if you get on Highway 151 and you travel north from Dubuque, you, you'll, you can get to Platteville and to Madison. Trust me on that one. You know where it goes. And so it is. It's like the devil saying, come on, let's go. She's like, hey, I know where this all goes. But, but stay, keeping steadfast in the word of God, being strong in prayer and surrounding yourselves with brothers and sisters in Christ who share the same values that you do, you know, where you're not going to be the lone ranger, where you're just going to be out there by yourself. Christians that say, I don't need to be part of the church to be a Christian. Well, what uh, Peter's saying here is you're going to be a dead duck. We need the company of the believers, people who are going to care about us, who are going to be strong, who love us, and who are concerned about us. You've got to find a church where they actually do care about you, where they're genuinely people of God's love, and they want to support you in the Christian walk. You have been watching To Know Christ with Rev. Jeff Peterson, pastor of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. For a donation of $15 or more, you can receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Prayer, A Practical Guide to Getting God's Direction. Thank you for watching, and tune in again next week for To Know Christ.